So it's, I think this just really tense waiting game of we need to do something now to help the folks who just don't have anything more to give. But we don't want to do too much and waste a bunch of effort and goodwill and money knowing that things are going to change in a little bit anyway. So to me, that feels like the biggest sort of ball of yarn to try and untangle. Welcome to Conversations That Matter, a podcast from Unifor. Here, we explore the latest customer experience trends, sales insights, innovations in AI and automation, and more with well-known thought leaders and industry experts. Tune in and join the conversation. Welcome, everyone, to another podcast. I am so excited that you're here. I'm your host, Randy Starr from Unifor. And today, we are going to focus our conversation on on AI, but also on design. We think both of those are definitely centered around the human aspect of it and making sure that we're always thinking uh, of putting in the customer value and sometimes the employee value, because sometimes these AI solutions are going in both directions in terms of helping the employee experience as well as the customer experience. So today we have a designer with a passion for human-centered design and has a passion for uh, leading brands to create some world-class experiences. And she is the uh, Chief Design Officer at Grand Studio. It's none other than Diana Dival. Welcome. Thanks, Randy. It's so nice to be here. I'm so excited you're here. Uh, I think uh, the influence that you've had in the industry uh, with uh, one of your books, Conversations with Things, uh, has been phenomenal. So uh, we're going to get into that topic uh, quite a bit because I think uh, a lot of people, especially uh, others that I've interviewed on the podcast, have actually mentioned you and your co-author, and that book as a design uh, kind of reference uh, in all things related to voice and 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 design. So definitely uh, really uh, appreciate you coming on today. That is so sweet. I'm a little uh, <laughs> embarrassed, like Red Chief, but that's, that's very sweet. <laughs> For those that are listening to it on the audio, uh, she's turning really red and then I'm, I'm waving her off virtually. Um, <laughs> So uh, we, we like to start the podcast uh, on kind of breaking a myth, uh, but today we're kind of similar to that, but we want to switch up to kind of the, the, uh, the verbiage, the lingo. Um, and I wanted to get your take on something that we've been thinking about here at Unifor around, uh, around the future. And so um, everyone's talking about the future. Um, everyone's talking about AI, but I wanted you to complete this sentence. Uh, the future of enterprise AI is human. I mean, right. I think this maybe sounds obvious, but like, yeah. especially in an enterprise, you have so many bodies and so many people and the people that are going to end up using AI. I mean, I know there's also this sort of push slash fear that AI is going to replace people. Um, but I think particularly when we think about AI for enterprise, that is not actually the goal. The goal is to get people to do their jobs more efficiently. And yeah honestly not spend so much time doing the stuff that kind of slows them down. It's not that interesting. And so that means people are going to be using the AI and people are going to be part of that process. And if you are going to try to launch AI and enterprise successfully, it has to be about the people or it's not, it's not going to go well. Yeah. I mean, that's very true. Um, and I, I love that, uh, you know, I, I saw what you wrote uh, on your website. Uh, you had a ebook, uh, around around that topic, around AI and human, and that kind of partnership, and so um, I definitely think that's a key, um, not just in a design perspective, but also in a process and workflow perspective, in how you look at vendors that you're trying to choose, um, yeah. in terms of the relationships that you're building. So it, it's all part of it, right? Absolutely, yeah. I think um, I mean the good thing is that there are, it's not a new idea, right? Like centering the human is not something that somebody just came up with. It's been around for quite a while. So I think there are a lot of folks that um, if you're doing some digging in different AI vendors, that's not an uncommon philosophy. I think it's just more about like how present at the forefront is it for some folks. Yeah, for sure. Um, so tell us uh, a little bit about your background. Uh, we talked a, bit, a little bit about your, your, your book, but kind of um, want to know specifically around what was the turning point uh, where AI is now your focus and, and you know, the combination of design and AI is your focus? Where was that turning point in your career? 
Um, I think that really started when I got a job working for a company, a health tech company called Emmy, which was later bought by Walters Kluwer Health. So if you're familiar with either one of those brands. Um, up until then, I'd been working in entertainment and doing all kinds of things, but a lot of producing, a lot of script yeah. writing. And uh, when I went to go work for this health tech company, the role was really started out as very much um, a writer. That's kind of how yeah. they had it outlined. And it was, you're going to write things so that patients, everyday people can understand it because clinicians are sort of notoriously bad at explaining medical ease to everyday humans. Yeah. I was like, great. Yes. I love science. I love writing. This is going to be fantastic. And very yeah. quickly, I did not have the language for design. I'm a playwriting major from school. Okay. Um, so this was like very much like a, a kind of first foray into the design world. But what sure. became very apparent very quickly is it's not unlike doing um, any amount of arts background, especially like journalism. And I think like the production work that I had done was very similar to how UX researchers approach a lot of their work. Yeah. And the product itself was when I came into the company at a precipice, like we were just within probably about a year of my joining, it branched okay. off into more interactive, um, like online education. So there was already yeah. some branching logic that needed to happen there. There was um, some GUI products that started to come out, very small things like flu shot and doctor appointment reminders that then kind of evolved and grew from there. And that was really, I think, the the turning point for my career of, oh, this is a thing. This is a thing that I enjoy that kind of brings together all of the different parts of my experience and my brain. And I get to spend time with people and I get to write and I get to solve problems in a really holistic way that especially I think in healthcare, you have the ability to see an impact. Yeah. And then in terms of when AI came to the forefront, what, what was that? Um, was it in that job specifically or was there yeah. the next job that came about? So in that job specifically, um, in that product line development that are the food, the VUI products. Yeah. Again, they started as like appointment reminders. So very, very, very basic yeah. VUIs. But it quickly evolved into a product that was essentially following folks when they were leaving the hospital after a anything that the hospital could get financially dinged for. So things like a heart attack. I mean, I, yeah. you know, it's the way of the world, right? Like business right. kind of drives a lot of this Risk. stuff. Yeah. Um, but things like pneumonia, um, asthma, uh, stroke, heart attack. We created this oh, product cool. line that would check in with folks um, via an IVR-like system. Okay. Um, and then would record a lot of answers and do some triaging in the report back to the nursing staff who could then rather than the nurses having to be the ones to call yeah. every single person who gets discharged with any one of these very common things for the next yeah. 30 to 45 days you get an ai system now that can do that and That's collect cool. that data and then triage it for the nurse who can then go through and be like oh okay i actually really need to deal with these people these people are fine I love that. Um, my wife, my wife is a nurse practitioner over at, uh, Lucille Packard Stanford Children's uh, right around the corner from our offices here. And, um, that would be super helpful to have. So <laughs> it is. I'll, I'll have to tell her about that story, uh, about that product that you built. That's pretty cool. Um, and what time, uh, when was this? Um, how far back was this? My gosh, this must have been maybe 20, maybe 2012. Like around oh, then, okay. yeah. All right, very cool, very cool. Uh, and so, uh, how long have you been at Grand Studio for? I've been at Grand for about five and a half years now. So um, it's been a for fun transition. <laughs> yeah, and, and for those that aren't familiar with what you guys do, uh, tell us a little bit about what, what you guys do. Sure. So Grand is a digital product design and service design consultancy. So. Basically, what that means is instead of just working on conversational AI, I'm working on a whole slew of different products and services. And really what we end up doing is getting kind of these broad, vague asks from clients 
um, usually pretty complex structured clients. I can't name them for NDA purposes, but of course <laughs> you would know them. Um, and they, they have questions like, okay, we need to figure out how to serve the underbanked. What do we do? Or we need to figure out how to streamline surgeries, elective surgery across 50 different sites. Yeah. And so then what we do is come in and go, okay, let's figure out what exactly are the problems here that we need to solve, make sure we're identifying the right problems both for the business as well as users, and then develop whatever the right answer is for that. So sometimes that's operations, sometimes that's process, sometimes it's a digital tool, sometimes that's an AI tool, sometimes it's a mashup of all of those. It kind of just depends yeah. on the problem. Very cool. Uh, how big are you guys now? We're about 20 people. So we're very oh, boutique. Cool. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, we're about 850 people right now um, globally. So that's so uh, nice. We were once, yeah. So we were once there with, with, uh, at that level. Um, but it's cool. Uh, I love boutique agencies and uh, definitely used quite a few of them uh, in the past. Uh, so one of the things uh, that you, uh, eventually did uh, in your career as you uh, authored a book. I mean, you've done a lot of writing uh, on on the Hollywood side. And we'll talk about that uh, maybe in the rapid fire because uh, I love, I love, I want to get into that. Um, but your book, Conversations with Things, which you co-authored with Rebecca Evanho, um, love to kind of do a double click on that. Um, and not necessarily like about the book per se, um, but what I'm most interested in is what was the one piece of feedback or the kind of aha moment when you realized that it was helping uh, the overall community that was doing this conversation design uh, and and trying to figure out how voice plays into the customer experience? I don't know if there was like one singular moment, but I will yeah. say, I think I've personally been surprised, very pleasantly surprised, but just surprised and grateful at how many people send messages just to say like, I love this book. It is so helpful. It sits on my desk and I refer to it all the time. Yeah. Which I think especially in something that's as fast changing as AI and conversation design, yeah. the fact that like it came out in 2020 and it's 2023 and it's still useful <laughs> feels like kind of a feat. <laughs> yeah, it does. It, it's just so that. Uh, and that, you know, we'll just, I, I probably should have said this before, like for those that don't know what the book is, uh, one, we'll put it in the show notes, but can you just give us a quick summary? Uh, yep. The Cliff Notes version as, as uh, for those that uh, are in my generation, remember, uh, what was the Cliff Notes uh, version of the book? So Conversations with Things is basically a, a practical guidebook for anybody doing any kind of product design with conversational AI as a part of it. So it kind of walks you through like what the process should be, how to actually do things like documentation that sometimes are very difficult to find hard examples of. And then it also has some strategy and ethics baked into it as well. Very cool. Uh, and it's on Amazon, correct? It's on Amazon. And you can get it at Target. You can get it at Rosenfeld Media, which is the publisher. Okay. Very cool. All right. Well, uh, we'll put definitely a link in the show notes. Uh, and I know people will definitely find value in that. Um, so... One of your, as you mentioned in terms of your background, healthcare was a big part of, of your career before Grand Studio. Um, and I'm curious to know from your perspective, what is one uh, top challenge that healthcare leaders are dealing with when it comes to making their AI journey a, a reality? Yeah, I think this one is, this one's kind of tough because I feel like there's a lot vying for a lot of problems vying for leadership's uh, eyes right now in healthcare. Yeah. Um, certainly they've got, which, you know, we're still coming out of the pandemic. And so a lot of burnout and lack of staff. And I think along with that, just general burnout and not enough people to go around. Yeah. There's also a sort of let's let's fix this quick. Let's like get some tools in here. Let's make this work. So I think the thing that I see, and again, this is my bias because we're consultants, so we get brought in to like this part of the process. Yeah. But what I see a lot of is clinical staff and people that are on the ground 
with like 25 different tools and they hate all of them. None of them work together and they are sort of being asked to do more and more and more in the theory of making their jobs faster and easier, that it really just kind of adds more. So I think for leadership, they, the good leaders see that. And I think they are struggling with trying to figure out what do we, what do we actually build? What do we buy? How many of these do we realistically need? And there's also a sort of like underlying, um, you know, uh, elephant waiting in the wings, which is that the government's working on interoperability. So there is, you don't want to do too much because in five years, like, why are you going to build your own highway when the government's got a highway coming? You just got to wait a, a few more years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's, I think this just really tense waiting game of we need to do something now to help the folks who just don't have anything more to give. But we don't want to do too much and waste a bunch of effort and goodwill and money knowing that things are going to change in a little bit anyway. So to me, that feels like the biggest sort of ball of yarn to try and untangle. Um, do, you, do you feel like the, the role of, of figuring out the AI strategy uh, is something that is... I mean, where it was in 2020 is very different where, where it is now in 2023. Um, sure. And, you know, is that in change management? Is that at the CIO office? Is that, like, where is that, where do you think that role is that someone's going to take and kind of lead that uh, AI uh, journey? Yeah. I think, I know that a lot of healthcare systems are hiring, like, chief AI officers. Yeah. And... To me, it's somebody that's going to have to have almost be like half uh, COO, half CTO, where they really understand like the underpinnings of what a good AI can do and what it needs to do it well. I don't think they need to understand like how every single thing works, but they just need to have like, okay, I get that we need this, 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 and this in order for it to function from a technical perspective. But that change management piece, boy, I think that's how you get it adopted. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's like with any tool. I mean, you can bring in any AI tool and then it's, all right, heck, it could be like a new intranet. <laughs> we'll just take AI out of this. Like how are you going to get that's people to, to adopt the intranet and, and get that, that employee engagement? I mean, it's, it's just uh, has nothing to do with the technology. Yeah. I mean, we um, see a lot of this all the time. And I think the people that do it well are the people that have um, different levels of folks all the way up to yeah. leadership weighing in, yeah. whether that's a task force or a committee, or you just have like a couple of key folks that you can go to and get yeah. intel from at those levels, because yeah. they're all they're all swamped by different things. So <laughs> being able to like kind of get a little bit from everybody, make sure that you're at least aware of all the things that you're going to potentially be up against or run into. So one of the things that you're have a lot of experience on it on you know on the IVA IVR side of things is the ability to uh, decipher the voice side of things, um, and and also the text and you know whatever the the input method is from from the from the user, um, and in the past couple of weeks there's been a lot of interesting. Uh, announcements around multimodal AI, and that's like a, a big thing uh, in terms of what what people are are expecting, right? Not only are vendors coming out with that, but also people are expecting that that's just the norm because that's how they use their iPhone or Android phone. Um, so, why do you think uh, you know? One is let's break down multimodal AI, and then second is why do you think that's going to be the game changer? towards uh these ai experiences yeah um okay so i should start with i mean i think it's maybe obvious because we've talked so much about conversational ai but like that is definitely my background and my bias there's all kinds of ai and certainly there are other ways of interpreting multimodal ai than just with the conversational lens but that is my background so that's how i interpret it um the the way that I think about multimodal experiences overall is 
when you are able to use different modes, in some cases, in this case, like voice, to mm-hmm. ask something, you can have a response back that comes up on a different modality. So in this, maybe it's on a text on your phone or, I mean, I, AI can go across many things. So you could yeah. have a chart pop up uh, if you're using a deaf word that, that populates, but is triggered by language. So yeah. um, I think the, uh, I, again, like the healthcare sort of lens that I have, um, some of my partners work more in finance and doing things like uh, bond trading and things like that, where I could see this definitely having a play as well. Yeah. But for me, I think about like the operating room where we're already seeing a lot of AI coming into play, things like um, being able to do surgery via robots and being able to do it, um, use it for training and things like that too. If you can have a multimodal, successful multimodal interface, obviously this is very high stakes in a surgery, <laughs> the surgical <laughs> setting. Yes, for sure. <laughs> uh, but assuming that all goes well, uh, you can have p- a potential where you have the ability to, um, you know, you could have somebody that is directing uh, two surgeries at once using their voice if it's the exact same situation in both of them. And then you could be having screens that populate based on that person's uh, in each individual's situation so that the person directing with their voice can also receive information in a different modality while the AI is sort of controlling the actions. So that is still a little like far away, still a little um, (laughs) minority report-esque. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I love that movie. I mean, there's definitely been a few of those stories of, of I think it was like in the past few weeks, uh, where there was a, a doc physician that was doing uh, surgery uh, remotely. Um, yeah, and, and it wasn't, and I don't think that story was necessarily about AI. It was more just about doing it remotely. Um, but, but it, it, I think the data, that's the thing, though. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. We're seeing like the steps to get to situations like that, right? Like this. Yeah particular doesn't exist but like you know there have been ones that i've worked on before where we've done one sort of ai brain controlling a variety of different um modalities that people can interact with so sms text as well as uh a phone call and voice assistant as well as um triggering things to come through via email so that there's communication and, and back and forth and that support yeah. system that people are looking for when they do you experience a, a conversational experience? Yeah. We're starting to see it appear in numerous different experiences. Um, and, you know, we'll take a look at Alexa. It's definitely, um, you know, right now it's just voice, but you can imagine, especially like with the Echo Show, that's going to be something different. Um, even on, on our end, I mean, we're, our, our software is be able to, to take stuff in via voice, even video, and then I'll put it back out to the customer, depending on what they want. You know, think of like a banking experience. Um, that's that's a pretty powerful one where you can send them, you know, cross sales or upsells to their phone to verify their information or to to give them an offer. So I think there's uh, so many possibilities. Um, yeah, there's. I'm just thinking about. Um, you mentioned the the Echo Show um, for retail. I don't know if you remember, but like the Alexa had a had a skill at one point or like a, a functionality where uh-huh. you could essentially try on clothes. It was, and I keep hearing about, <laughs> this is probably the circles I run in, but people <laughs> wanting the, um, they don't want AI, they want the closet from uh, Clueless. <laughs> okay. Where it's like, she could just like, hey, pick out an outfit for me. Um, but Echo Show kind of had that for a minute where you could yeah. see what clothes look like on you. And so that exact kind of um visual response to a, a voice interface is, is really kind of cool yeah uh the book uh conversation with things are you guys gonna come out with another version of it uh the next year oh, or boy. is that too much I... or, is that, or is that too much of a, a <laughs> of a lift <laughs> what does that your response uh, i think says it all but... i will say this i am uh, constantly learning every day with all of the stuff that everybody is doing. And I think that was a big part of writing the first version of the book. Um, 
So if that were to happen, and I think that's a big if for both Rebecca and myself, um, I think we're still in the information gathering phase. But yeah. I'd honestly rather see somebody else uh, write it, <laughs> not, not just because I'm exhausted, but also because I think um, getting a fresh voice in here and a fresh perspective of somebody that really is hands-on with it right now would be very exciting. Yeah. Um, you you attended a conference recently. I think it was the Voice AI conference. Um, I think it was, it was a uh, DC. Uh, AI4, I think, was the most recent one I was at. Is that okay? Um, sorry, I got that wrong. I was thinking, I was thinking of Kane Sims and uh, the UX world. Um, yeah. And uh, we, we've, my coworker was on his podcast just recently, and um, I was kind of curious, what are, what are some of the uh, topics that you're speaking about at, at some of the conferences these days? Because I know um, you, you're definitely, uh, you know, you're valuing the community in terms of what you're sharing, uh, what's some of the things that you've been sharing out there? So I think um, right now, at least this year, I've been talking, it, it's been a lot of healthcare. Um, yeah. <laughs> I do like things other than healthcare, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've actually worked a lot with uh, AI and retail as well. Um, but this year has been very focused on healthcare. And I think because just in general, this year has been a little weird financially for everyone. The sort of will they, won't they with the recession. Um, people have had their budgets constrained. They haven't been able to hire in-house. They haven't been able to hire out of house. They, even yeah. the projects that were greenlit have now just been like, well, let's just optimize things. So I think the stuff that I've been talking about is basically how do we optimize? How do we take the limited amounts of funds or resources, energy that we have? And mm -hmm. how do we, is AI the right, actually the right thing to do in this moment? If it's not, how can we as businesses sort of set up for when that does release a little bit later, hopefully next year, yeah. maybe the year after to make sure that we're putting things in place during this sort of um, restricted time to make sure we're right. Right. Awesome. I mean, I think that's a, that's a good point. I mean, uh, for, so for those that are listening in, uh, we appreciate you. We thank you for, for tuning into this podcast. Um, and I, I think that uh, it's definitely a, a good time where we're kind of towards the, the, the latter part of, of the year, the fall. And uh, I think everyone's taking a look at, what their business is doing, where ways they can optimize resources, budget. So you're, you're, you're right on, you're right on, on that. So, um, we will, uh, we'll see where things go, but, uh, if you guys ever need any advice, uh, definitely, I would say, uh, you know, Diana, you're a wealth of information. And I think, uh, uh, you know, we'll just give you your information out right now. We're not done with the podcast, but uh, what's the best way that people can uh, reach out to you? Uh, because I think uh, this is a good point of <laughs> what we're talking about. Yeah, easiest ways are just via Grand Studio. We have a hello at grandstudio.com email that comes to me. Um, also LinkedIn. I, I don't check it every day, but frequently yeah. enough that if you send me a message, I will probably see it. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, okay, uh, so last question before we get to the rapid fire, because I love rapid fire. I love that the, the game show ask of it. Uh, <laughs> The last question we have is, uh, you know, you talk to a lot of conversation designers uh, and would we'll love to know what is one myth uh, that you'd like to dispel about uh, when you're training conversation designers? What's the one myth, something that you kind of keep, keep on have to repeat or re-explain? So I don't know if this is a myth. It maybe just depends on the person's background. But I have had um, people come in from basically like two different tracks one is more of a, a writing track huh? and any sort of like dialogue based track and then the other is more of a design track yeah. um for the people that come in through the design track i feel like the biggest thing that i constantly have to tell them is script it first don't jump to flows don't jump to logic yes you can like sort of generally get a sense of like what are the use cases that we're going to be encompassing yeah. here but if you don't figure out what the rhythm of the conversation is and what kinds of things might come up in a natural course of conversation you're gonna have to redo all of those flows anyway okay <laughs> that's that's great yeah that's, that's a good point that's a good point um all right uh so uh well thanks uh, thanks for 
answering all of our questions so far. It's been really interesting to hear about your background, hear about kind of the healthcare side of things and, and how um, you wrote the book with Rebecca um, and just uh, lots of great advice from an AI strategy and more of a business um, kind of uh, strategy perspective. So thanks for, for sharing that awesome info. Thank you. All right. So uh, rapid fire. Uh, last time we did a podcast, we did a kind of Jeopardy style. Um, and so imagine uh, there uh, was a, 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 a list of, uh, you know, from uh, 200 to 1,000 Jeopardy theme style uh, questions, and your name was the topic, uh, was a category. Um, you know, you, you never know what's going to happen on Jeopardy. Um, but this is one that we ask uh, quite a bit on the podcast. Uh, so imagine you were calling into a contact center. Uh, you had a customer support issue. You had something needs to get fixed. Uh, maybe it was your your internet. Maybe it was you were turning something, whatever it might be. Um, and a celebrity musician or artist, dead or alive, could answer that particular phone call. Uh, they could solve your problem. You'd be put at ease. You'd be going your merry way. You'd have an amazing day. Who would that uh, celebrity be? Um, I don't know if this person is a celebrity, but immediately when I think about calling into customer support, ironically, it's probably an IT issue. Yeah. So the person that jumps to mind is the doll guy because okay. he <laughs> knows computers and is would give me very chill customer service. <laughs> All right. I don't know if he's still around. But I, I, don't maybe... think, I don't know. I hope he is. I yeah. mean, like he was not yeah. that old. No, no, no. Yeah, exactly. No, I meant in terms of Dell. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll have to look him up on LinkedIn so if any of our podcast community can uh, find out if the Dell guy uh, is on to another gig, we, we want to know. Um, but yes, he, he was, he was, he's a good guy. He would definitely help you out. Um, so if you weren't doing your job right now, uh, what would you be doing? Hospice. I did some work um, on that uh, health tech company writing some hospice education stuff and did some ride-alongs yeah. and it is just uh, like the most impactful work it's exhausting and people that do it are amazing but i also just saw so much so many meaningful moments and i <laughs> say this kind of a lot of like man this is kind of the worst best job it, it just is fascinating to me all right well Maybe it'll get you a chance. Maybe uh, it'll happen, but that's really cool. Um, and maybe this is related, but what is one nonprofit you support? Brave Space Alliance. They are a BIPOC trans-led um, community center on the south side of Chicago, and they're incredible. They do such amazing work for the community. Oh, very cool. All right, we'll put a link in the show notes. Um, and you had this in your bio. Uh, I was reading on, on Amazon, but you like puns. Um, <laughs> so... I don't know if you have a pun, but uh, I follow this guy on TikTok, and he, I think he's in the UK. I have to send it to you, but he literally is like, hey, do you want a pun? Do you want a pun? And people just literally just say, like, I don't know, um, clowns. And then he does a pun, like, literally like, on, on, improv on the spot. <laughs> this is, like, the best thing in the world. Uh, oh, wow. hours, hours of enjoyment going through his reels. Um, <laughs> probably too long, too much. But do you have a favorite pun? That's the question. I I love doing um, celebrity name puns. Um, my husband and I do this to each other. Like if we're eating too much, we're like, man, I feel fatsy Klein or I feel gaseous clay and just <laughs> try to get as ridiculous as possible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, you know, this... all right, there you go. Uh, but then I'll send you the, uh, the pun guy. I can't, I can't oh, remember please. his name off the top of my head, but uh, I'll send it to you. He's probably on of their channels but yeah um and then uh lastly what is your best day if you were to have an amazing day whether it's work and family whatever it is like what, what's your best day um uh, let's see probably wake up and i'm an early riser so i love waking up with the sun it's waking up it's a sunny day it's maybe gonna be peak like 68 degrees out so sweatshirt okay. and shorts kind of weather and i get to snuggle with my kid in bed and then have some coffee and just read for a while and then go for a walk, go play in the park and 
if you go for a bike ride, I think come home and read and do more coffee. I just went, <laughs> I love reading. Uh, well, what's, what's the last book you read? Or oh, what are you reading? Uh, I am reading the, the Stolen Air right now. It's by Holly Black. It's a YA novel. Um, I've been kind of consuming. I got a Kindle. Yeah. So I've been just like, I've been using the Libby app on the Kindle. And this is going to be yeah, my yeah. plug for the Libby app. <laughs> it's great. No, it's the way to get all of your Kindle books from the library or free. Yeah, yeah. yeah we use that too. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, I've just been going through them like candy, like one a, one a week, just kind of shuffling through Vero- things. A ferocious reader. Uh, that's awesome. Well, cool. Well, uh, you, you survived the rapid fire. Uh, so uh, thank you for, uh, for for joining us on the podcast today. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. This was so delightful. And for those uh, that want to learn more about you, we said it a little, a little earlier in the podcast, but um, just give us uh, your, your contact details and Grand Studio details uh, one more time. Sure. So uh, for me, you can reach out via Grand Studio at hello at grandstudio.com or you can reach me directly on LinkedIn. Send me a message over there. Awesome. All right. So you guys have any AI uh, strategy advice, if you have any conversation design uh, advice, business uh, strategy as well. Uh, I think we've talked a lot about that and even on the healthcare side. um, But that's definitely, uh, Diana is definitely a great resource uh, to talk to. So thanks, everyone. Uh, Thanks, Diana, first of all. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, uh, for joining in to another podcast uh, episode. And we always appreciate the feedback. Uh, We definitely want to hear from you guys. Email us at podcast at unifor.com. And, you know, we just want to know how can we improve? Uh, Is there certain topics, certain uh, people you want us to talk to? We always like to to hear kind of what's going on on the other side of the uh, earbuds, as they say. So have a great day and we'll talk to you guys soon. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Conversations That Matter. Subscribe to our podcast for more great content. And if you want to learn more about the topic we discussed, visit unifor.com today.